Hello, my beautiful audience. Welcome to the final episode of season one on one of Pop Talk. I'm your host, Cody McDonald, and today I am joined by an individual who I've been wanting to have on this show for a very long time. He's a cinema lover, he's a film lover, and most importantly, he's a movie lover. I'm talking about KJ Prue. How the hell are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm really good. Sorry for <laughs> quite the introduction. I'm just very excited to have you on here finally. I'm excited to be on here. <laughs> I Like I mentioned before, I think, uh, you love movies, right? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> just, just a tiny bit, yeah? Just a little bit, yep. <laughs> yeah, you, you have like a library of films right behind you. A giant <laughs> Blu-ray collection. <laughs> it's a hobby. <laughs> Hey, so be it. Physical media is a thing that uh, I hope doesn't go away because it'd be nice to have the options of buying the films that you love immediately. The day physical media is not available in stores or even online, it's going to be a sad day for me. (laughs) (laughs) How excited were you to know that movie theaters are back open again? I was there day one, so I would say very excited. (laughs) Because I think right when the movie theaters open... Wasn't it just like a comic book movie, a action film, a comedy, a family film, just all released at once? Yeah. The worst Fast and Furious movie in the franchise. (laughs) Uh, Oh, no. Yeah, it seemed to be kind of a slumpy summer. I mean, honestly, it's even hard to just like judge a film based on its release date and just the timing of everything just in general because of the pandemic. I mean, just, I don't know if you just heard about this recently, like as of like today, Top Gun Maverick got delayed again. Yeah, but not by that much. It was already going to be coming out next year anyways, so. No, no, no. It was supposed to be the summer of 2020. Then it got pushed to the winter of 2020. Then it got pushed to the summer of 2021. Then it got pushed to the winter of 2021. And now it's getting pushed to the spring of 2022. It's like. Oh, weird. You know what? I actually forgot that it was supposed to come out this winter. (laughs) Yeah, that's well. That's where it was initially supposed to be uh, coming out. Oh, I guess I missed that release date. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's happening so much. Everything's just shifting. It's gonna be hard to like go back and be like, what are the best films of two thousand twenty one? Like, I kind of almost want to wait till the end of this decade, to be honest, to make a giant list of the best films of the decade. Which is it's what I did for the uh, for the two thousand tens. But I used to always do every film individually, and it's been since 2019 that I was able to properly make a top 20, 25 movies. But last year, I just called my list uh, 20 movies that I just happened to catch in 2020. <laughs> that's all I, I <laughs> on my letterbox, that's all I labeled it as. Yeah, I kind of agree with you as far as what comes out which years. Because I was re-looking back at things and saw something that was technically a 2019 or 2020 movie, but I thought it was 2021, so... And and also, I mean, it's always been this problem anyways, but just independent films, too. It's going to be even harder to determine, is that a 2020 movie? Is that a 2021 movie? Like, it was released last year in the festivals, so does that count? Is that? But then it was released on VOD? Like, it's just, it's so hard to determine anymore. I also feel bad for all the indie movies and stuff that keep getting sold to Prime Video and Netflix and things like that, because there's so many of them now, and they're always overshadowed by the big budget ones that get picked up by Prime Video, like The Tomorrow War, for example. Like Those movies will get a lot of viewers, but then those indie ones get picked up, and no one even knows they're on the service. That's the part that bugs me. Yeah, it's almost like every single piece of content, and I'm using that word very lightly, (laughs) I, I hate using that word now to describe cinema, but like Every single piece of art that comes out, whether it's a small film or a big film, should just be treated with at least the exact same amount of attention, especially during these times. Oh, yeah, I agree. hundred percent. But even during these times, even if we can't get into the films, at least uh, we can sit down and read a book. I think that's what it's called, a book. (laughs) It's a thing with uh, words on it, top to bottom, left to right. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. I think you're right on that because I haven't read a book in many years. I used to, but not anymore. Uh, Have you read a lot of comic books? Uh, Well, as far as comic books go, I really haven't read anything outside of Spider-Man. It was because of Spider-Man that I got into comics in the first place. Which uh, 
issues did you read? I guess that's the term. I'm not really big into comic books, so I don't even know if that's the right term. It's a, it's an issue, right? Right. And it was the Spider-Man movies. So it was basically after Spider-Man 3, but more around when Andrew Garfield started playing Spider-Man 2012, 2013. I kind of started going back and wanted to learn about the history of Spider-Man. So I read, I don't know, a few hundred issues, I guess, of the original Amazing Spider-Man comics. I just tried to go classic with the comic books. I never really felt like getting into the newer stuff. And uh, eventually I just fell off. But as far as reading Spider-Man, I did get pretty far into the original series. That's cool. The only comic books I've ever read in my life, honestly, were these. uh, It was a three-part series released by Dark Horse uh, Comics. It was, uh, do you remember that movie I showed you way back in the day, uh, Titan AE? How can I forget? (laughs) How can no one forget? (laughs) (laughs) It's it's a little gem, whatever. Give it a break. <laughs> it's not a great movie. It's just a fine movie that I, it's it's almost like nostalgia food at this point. Just a a Don Bluth animated a Don Bluth animated love letter to sci fi kind of movie. All I can say is that everyone loves what they love, and I am not a fan of Titan Eight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so be it. It's fine. It's not for everybody. It's pretty. It's pretty uh, cut and paste of a lot of other movies, a lot of other sci-fi <laughs> movies, I should say. But the uh, the the uh, the comic books that I read were a three-part sort of backstory on uh, Kale, the main character in the movie, played by uh, Matt Damon. It's based on his father, and his father in the movie was voiced by Ron Perlman. And this is sort of like the story of him and how he like developed the Titan. That's the thing that like it brings back humanity. It's like a sec. It's a, it's a, it's a ship that like makes another earth essentially. And this, the whole comic book was the whole series was just how he developed his crew and how he was able to like get the funding and get all the resources to build the Titan. And that was kind of it. And as far as like comic books, my history on that, I think I may have churn. I may have opened the page of, a Mace Windu comic book one time when I was a kid, and I thought it was so lame that I just put it down immediately. I just don't have that much of a, an experience with comic books, to be honest. However, I am very knowledgeable, I should say. Well, not very knowledgeable, but I've seen quite a bit of comic book films. And um, why don't you and I talk about a certain hero that you just name dropped a few minutes ago? Is it pizza time? Oh, it's most certainly pizza time, KJ. <laughs> And I and we are of course talking about a film from 2004, Spider-Man 2. It is the second film in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. Uh, I guess we all kind of know the whole story behind Spider-Man. The teenager Peter Parker gets bit by a radioactive spider. One of the last things that he hears from his uncle Ben is with great power comes great responsibility and after the tragic death of his uncle, he takes that advice to heart and he becomes a superhero to fight villains and yeah that's kind of that's kind of just broadly like not only just like the setup to who spider-man is but just like in the first film as well and the second film spider-man 2 that came out in 2004 directed by sam raimi starring toby mcguire kirsten dunce james franco alfred molina rosemary harris and jk simmons and the story is essentially about How does Peter Parker balance out his whole life as a teenager, as a student, as someone who's trying to get into the workforce, just have a career in something? But also at the same time, how does he balance that out with being a superhero? And at the same time, one of his admirers, one of his, you know, all-time idols, Otto Octavius, played by Alfred Molina, becomes the villainous Doc Ock. And it's just a... uh, a struggle of him trying to remain his identity and at the same time try to keep the ones that he loves all intact. <laughs> now, we should definitely keep it a little bit focused and, and just talk primarily about the second one, but I'm just curious. So what, what are your thoughts on the first film as well as just the whole, uh, I guess, the whole sort of trilogy of the, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films? Well, the first film is the film that introduced me to the character to begin with. And because of that, I just appreciate it anyways. But it helps that it's also just a great movie all around. It does start to feel its age nowadays, unlike the second movie. Yeah. I mean, I might as well just ask this, but what are your thoughts on the third film, Spider-Man 3? 
I feel like we could have an even longer podcast talking about the third one than we're going to have with this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's only so much you can say. There's only so many times that you can say, was that necessary? Was that necessary? Because the third film is just sort of um, a little too much of everything, I'll say. Like, there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of bad stuff. But on uh, on on the whole, it's just a little muddled. It's a, it's actually I just watched it recently, just out of curiosity, and obvious. And I I kind of skimmed through the first film again. The third film was a lot more on the nose than I was expecting. There's just a lot of obviousness in compared to the second film. The second film actually has a lot of surprising moments of like nuance and subtlety. And comparing that even with the first film, the first film. While it's still fun and it's a really good setup to just who Spider-Man is, it's a very traditional sort of backstory on like a a superhero. the The lighting wasn't that good in the movie, like especially during the nighttime scenes. I feel like it was trying too much to be like a comic book movie with like all the transitions and just trying to have it be sort of like edgy, but for the sake of being edgy. It's a lot of fun to watch William Defoe play <laughs> the Green Goblin and just how ridiculously over the top that he is on doing this whole like Jack Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of thing. That's part of the charm of the first movie though, is, is his performance. Yeah. It, well, it's, it's also like corny. It, it, the, the whole film, all, all three films have like the sense of corniness and sort of endearing tone to it. But with the second film, Spider-Man two, I find it to be quite excellent because it just finds the right balance between trying to take the film seriously enough with all the drama. But at the same time, it's a very funny movie. It's a very well-made movie when it comes to its action sequences. It might quite possibly be like one of the best superhero films of all time. I personally think it still is like at least in the top five, top three, two, one best superhero movies ever made anyways, still to this day. One quick question. Do you think it's better than most of the MCU films? Because I think so. I think it's better than almost every single MCU movie. Yeah, I, 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 I may, maybe with the exception of Guardians of the Galaxy, maybe. I do have a feeling that if I were to put a list together, I think Spider-Man 2 might just be at the top. It might quite possibly be in my top three, I would say. Maybe the Dark Knight, maybe the Christopher Reeve Superman from 1978 would be in there. Uh, Tim Burton's Batman, Guardians of the Galaxy, like we said. Maybe Avengers Endgame. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> I haven't really made an official list. Like I said, the corniness is very entertaining. It's lighthearted. It's very endearing. Like I mentioned before on one of these shows that growing up, like I used to watch a lot of films that had that right sort of balance between taking the film seriously enough, but it also has a lot of comedy, a lot of fun aspects in it, and nothing really overshadows one or the other. And with the exception of perhaps perhaps maybe one cut in this film, and I'll get to it when we break down the film, I don't think any of the comedy undercuts the drama, and I don't think of it vice versa as well. I agree with that completely. Okay. <laughs> Short and simple. But, but uh, I also do believe that there's scenes throughout the movie, as I was rewatching it, that don't quite hold up for me, even though as, as much as I love every single thing about this movie, there are moments, we'll get to them later, but parts like him just smiling and walking down the street to the song Raindrops are falling on my head. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take that over the dancing Peter any day. Of course. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> like, well, KJ, tell me, when did you first watch this film and what were your first thoughts? Well, this is just the person that I am, but I can basically remember 90% of the movies I've seen in theaters, where I've seen them and when I've seen them. And I remember in 2004, I was on a camping trip with my parents, just being excited about the fact that we were going to take a break from the trip and just drive to the theater and see Spider-Man 2. I think at the time I was 11 years old. And the entire time I was on that trip, I was just looking forward to seeing that movie. So you kind of look at every single movie going experience as like something very memorable that you take home. Yeah, even if the movie's terrible, if it's great, that's just something I do. And it just sticks in my mind for some reason. Like someone could ask me when I saw a specific movie. And as long as I did see it in theaters, I can pretty much tell them the theater, what year, which month, where I saw it. That's pretty impressive. We'll have to play that game some other time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. 
I mean, I was 11 years old at the time. The entire movie was just incredible to me. I grabbed the movie as soon as I could after it was done in theaters and kept rewatching it. At the time, I just, at the time, it really wasn't cinema to me like it is now. Like, I look at the movie so much more different than I did back then when I was a kid. It was just Spider-Man, and I wanted to see the action. Even though at, at the time, I still enjoyed all of the emotional drama and, and the filmmaking aspects of it. I, I could almost just tell that it was a well-made movie at the time. Yeah. Nowadays, I'm just I I look at it I look at it with a completely new eye these days. And and feel free to share that while we break it down for sure. My uh, my history behind this film was almost identical to yours. Um, after uh, I think it was just my mom and I when we checked out the first Spider Man in 2002, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And then around the time when I was like 10 years old, that's when I was using QuickTime dot com a lot and they had this like segment on their of just movie trailers i mean we're talking like way back then like this is before youtube was popular where i was watching movie trailers on like low res quality being like it just i remember being hyped for like you know uh i robots that summer i remember being excited to see red eye i remember being excited to see day after tomorrow or war of the worlds steven spielberg's war of the worlds yeah i actually went through this phase to I think it was around 2000, somewhere in 2006, maybe 2007, whenever the trailer came out for Spider-Man 3. I loved this movie so much that at the time, I was like downloading the trailer to QuickTime so that I could watch it in full res on my computer at the time. I think I watched the trailer to Spider-Man 3 50 to 100 times. (laughs) I was so excited for it because of this movie. Well, it's funny because I was actually like excited for the second one based on my experience with the first film because... Oh, KJ, I have to tell you, and I don't think I went into detail with this, but that first trailer for Spider-Man 2, I watched that, yeah, 50 to 100 times. It was the first time ever being hyped for a film, just on my own personal experiences. Like, I, I knew I had this instinct that, like, this movie is going to deliver. And in hindsight, the trailer showed almost everything in the film, which I kind of laugh at. I watched it. I rewatched that trailer like a few days ago. And I was just like, how the hell was I even like surprised after this film? Because it was just all there in that whopping two and a half minutes. Every single beat was in it. I think I need to go back and actually watch that trailer. It's been a couple of years since I've gone back to watch it. Uh, honestly, recently, I've become like a trailer fanatic. I just love the way when a great trailer is just edited properly or like edited so, or just edited in a way that it's just going to sell it to the masses. I don't know. I just think that sometimes making a trailer is even a craft in itself. But back in the day, I never really, I guess you could say I never looked for trailers the way you did for this one. Um, I think I only saw the Spider-Man 2 trailer a couple times before actually watching the movie. It was more of just seeing the first one and rewatching it so many times and just wanting to see the yeah. second one. And then my parents, like, knowing that I wanted to see it. So, like, I just ended up going to see it in theaters. Um, I remember seeing the whole, like, let's see who's behind the mask thing in the trailer, though, before that, too. So I see that that's what you're talking about, <laughs> moments like that. Yeah, like, the, it's just a perfectly well-cut trailer, and then ending off with that of just Harry saying, let's see who's behind the mask, and then just ripping it off, and it just cuts to black, and it says, coming in the summer of 2004 like it was just hyped i was hyped beyond the moon for this one and yeah when i finally saw it in the in the film i i i really i remember really liking it but it was surprisingly a lot more like i i I, it's almost like i i didn't know how to feel about certain moments in the film but i i had like a positive outlook on it at the same time same with you i remember buying the film the second it came out on dvd at the time had to have watched it a few dozen times and I just discovered what it was and I, I discovering what it was and why it's such a great film. And I, I had this feeling even in the first 15 minutes of the film, of how it just so brilliantly sets up Peter in this care in this movie and how it kind of evolves his character and just trying to humanize him is very fascinating where how does spider-man balance out his life as a student as someone who's working as someone trying to remain keep his identity hidden from his loved ones like it, it it's realistic and the the film just carries that whole theme very very focused almost throughout the whole film yeah i think you just said all of that stuff very great i started noticing things like that as well 
for me, it was around 2005, I think, 2006, when the DVD for this movie first came out. Back in the day, I had this little like portable DVD player. And once I got this movie on DVD, I think I sat like in my bed at night, every single night, watching it at least once. I think that lasted for months. <laughs> <laughs> I just started like analyzing everything. I was young, but I was I still felt like analyzing the movie. Yeah. I don't know if you've done this when this film came out, but you know, I was kind of a crafty kid just in my home life growing up. I took just like an a button up shirt, like because I didn't have like a suede jacket to use, but I found Doc Ock to be such a cool and fascinating looking villain that like I built my own robotic arms out of cardboard. <laughs> So I taped it to the back of this shirt and I just had, I just literally cut out like literally about like a couple of inches wide, but like a, a long pieces of cardboard. It must've been from like a fridge box or something. And then anytime I felt like I wanted to like extend the arms, I would just cut off the claw part and just keep duct taping or scotch taping on more arms and they were always like flopping down like the two that were on the top were always <laughs> flopping down in front of my sh on my shoulders and how I was able to like get a reference on how the claws look like was because in my room I had that famous uh, poster of Doc Ock just looking at like kind of like to the side view and he's kind of looking in the camera and all the claws are kind of like right in front of the camera yeah I, remember I had that, that on my wall I had that on my wall for years just a very fascinating character yeah, I agree. That character is great. However, it wasn't until, I guess, five, six, seven, eight years ago, something like that, where I started getting more into villains and like thinking they're the most interesting parts of stories sometimes and stuff like that. Back when I was a kid watching movies like this, I never really thought Doc Ock was the best part of the movie or anything like that. He's definitely one of the best parts of the movie, and I realize that now, but... <laughs> yeah, like Alfred Molina, he comes from like... I mean, he popped up, you know in a few films and a lot of like Broadway performances. And in fact, he was so shocked when Sam Raimi approached him and was like, do you want to be in this film? And he just was never used to such a big Hollywood movie like that at the time that he was so caught off guard, but also kind of giddy at the same time because he was a fan of the comics. And in the film, it's very fascinating with him where Alfred Molina feels like it, it, it isn't just, it doesn't just come out out of nowhere it doesn't just happen on a dime of him just turning bad when he was like introduced to Peter he just seemed like a very like intense kind of egotistical very passionate scientist that it didn't feel like him just getting influenced by the claws talking to him and just kind of you know manipulating him and sort of like influencing to be a villain it didn't all just come out of nowhere because he had that sort of like intensity to him already where he didn't feel like talking to peter right away and when he was talking about the infusion with peter he was just sort of like like this is my life's work i'm really into this you know like yeah and i agree with the fact that he's definitely he doesn't start out that way in the movie like he starts off egotistical as far as caring about his work and knowing that he's smart and all of these things. But that's sort of what helps him become who he was in the movie. And I think that that was just freaking genius. Yeah. Do you have a favorite moment from this film? I think I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> knowing you, because I've known you for years and we talk about this film and there's a, a moment that means a lot to you on a, almost a meaningful level. But tell our tell my beautiful audience what this scene is okay well i mean i could talk about this scene for days i'll keep it as short as i possibly can here <laughs> i don't know what it is about this scene it's stuck with me since i saw it and it still st sticks with me today sometimes i even look up this scene just to rewatch it i know this is jumping towards the end of the movie a little bit but it's the backyard scene when it may's preparing to move right that's what you were gonna say no <laughs> <laughs> Like, every line of dialogue just warms my heart in this scene. It's honestly just one of my favorite scenes in any movie ever. I don't I don't know what it is, really. Uh, back in high school, I, when I attempted to be an actor, I even took a couple auditions and used her speech as my monologue for the audition. There's just so much meaning behind the scene as far as where her character progressed from the first movie. And, like, her, just the words she speaks to Peter, it's just, it's the most moving part of the movie to me and of all three movies combined. Just about her talking about how there's a hero in each and every one of us, and we all should just not forget about that. And in order to kind of keep our uh, our sort of heroism intact, sometimes we have to give up our dreams and the things that we love the most just to keep at it. And then it pays off at the end, too, when he tells Doc Ock as Doc Ock's about to die and go sacrifice himself. 
to do what's right and to be steady, we have to be focused and give up the things that we want the most, even if it's yeah, our it's dreams. along those lines. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm paraf- I may be paraphrasing, or maybe I just got it down. I don't know. <laughs> it's bugging me. I know this movie like word for word, and I'm even drawing a blank on the quotes sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that that is an excellent part. I mean, a lot of fans of this film would definitely agree with you. It's definitely a highlight. I kind of went back and forth on this. I, it's kind of a cheat for me to say that like the first 15 minutes is my favorite part of the film because like I mentioned before I love just how the film establishes itself bouncing around between his two jobs try to like just be there on time getting fired trying to be Spider-Man trying to get on campus to be a student and to you know not fail trying to hold back his identity to MJ to Harry to Aunt May and as well he's trying to pay the rent (laughs) <laughs> the most important thing in the movie is that he has to pay his rent that's the motivation <laughs> the rest of the movie forget everything else forget about stopping Doc Ock and all that Peter has to pay the rent to Mr. Dickovich I just love the first moment you get to see him he's like just this creepy guy in the apartment going I have ears like a cat and eyes like a rodent <laughs> he makes like a like a <laughs> face <laughs> yeah <laughs> but then like peter gets inside but then right after that peter gets inside of his apartment and he just like sits down on the bed and he just stares if you think your life is hard look at that fucking face that's the most exhausted <laughs> person i've ever seen in my life that's one day in the life of peter parker that's one yeah. day yeah. so that's kind of why i love that's why i love i love the first 15 minutes just of how beautifully it's set up where you're like Ah, it's so nice to watch a a superhero movie where our main character is a human, something we can identify with or something we can relate to as well. Yeah. And most of the first movie is just like a natural progression of him being a nobody and like progressing to just being the star. And this movie kind of takes it in a completely different direction. And you even see that in the first 15 minutes, like you said. Because that's what sometimes great sequels do. I I put Spider-Man 2 up there with the Godfather Part Two, Empire Strikes Back, Aliens, T Two. Oh yeah, definitely in comparison to the first movie that it's coming off of. Of course, yeah, I agree. And unfortunately, sometimes the third film it just falls short because I think sometimes the second chapter peaks so high that there's nowhere to go but down from there. Unless you're Return of the King. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's one rare exception where like each film gets better and better. <laughs> <laughs> but even though that, that even though that's my f- favorite chunk, I think like as a quick little moment, I I love the scene where Peter is trying to like stop the train from going off of the from the incomplete tracks. And I I still even remember when I saw it in the theater, my mom and I turned to each other and had this look of like, "Oh shit, like Peter does not care about his identity because like i think his mask gets kind of like messed up during this action scene and he takes it off and he's just telling all the passengers to hang on but he has no mask and we're both looking at each other like oh shit like people are gonna know who he is yeah people are already seeing him (laughs) yeah and then it, it pays off so wonderfully after when he finally stops the train by like trying to like I know it's a meme now. I mean, it wouldn't be the first thing that's a meme from this movie, but just Tobey Maguire's <laughs> expression of him just trying to like, trying to use all the strength that he has to try to like web the train from not going off the cliff. And then he gets exhausted and he's about to pass out. But then all the passengers like lift him up and they kind of like crowd surf him almost and they bring him down. And when he wakes up and he realizes, oh my God, my mask is off. They're all, they're all kind of like, we're not going to tell anybody. We're just so happy that you're back, Spider-Man. I don't know. It always That, that scene always like resonates with me, personally. It's definitely just a moment in a superhero movie that's just a happy moment, though. Because in reality, that scene would not play out that way. <laughs> well, especially today, if like people on their phones will be all like Snapchatting, Oh, look, Spider-Man is on our train! Oh my god, look at <laughs> oh. this crap! Everybody would just be like, I mean, if you want to be like really obvious and on the nose, if it did play, take, take place today, they'd be like one person wanting to like take out their phone and, and record Spider-Man, but then another person would just be like putting the hand down and be like, no, don't do that. <laughs> it's like, now, now's not the time to use your phone. Don't live behind your phone. <laughs> and I wasn't even going with the phone thing either. I just mean in general, like there's someone that's going to want to take credit for the fact that they know who he is. And even if they don't know his name, they would give like a police sketch or whatever. And eventually everyone would know who he was. I just, I just think like it's a great moment in the movie, but it was just a movie moment in my, in my head. 
And you know what? Movie moments for for entertainment like this, movie moments are totally justified because this, this Sam Raimi just knows how to fill this entire film. And then obviously moments in the first and third film with just infectious moments where you're like the logic is obviously not quite there. But like it's all about feeling and it's all about like trying to get the audience to feel like they're sort of part of like this show, this showmanship almost like Sam Raimi is almost like a magician when it comes yeah. to these bigger spectacle films. And speaking of Sam Raimi, like you can tell in all three of his, spe- well, not so much in the third one, but you can tell in the first two Spider-Man movies, his roots from Evil Dead. Like you can see like there's scenes in there that are like very horrific. <laughs> Even though, even though it's tamed oh, down, oh yes, movie, like the scene when Doc Ock, like becomes Doc Ock in the hospital, like <laughs> that's when you know that the studio Sony gave Sam Raimi complete creative control because oh my god, that scene with the claws is legit something straight out of the Evil Dead. And sorry, since we're on the topic of Doc Ock, I know that you like to trail off into like fun facts and trivia later on, but I kind of want to throw something in fun for you right now, if you're okay with that. Go for it. Just a little side note here. In The Amazing Spider-Man 2, do you know Chris Cooper who played Norman Osborn there? Yes. Well, he actually auditioned for the role of Doc Ock back in 2003 or whenever they were auditioning, and he was getting close as the runner-up against Alfred Molina. Hmm. I'm... Happy that it wasn't him, <laughs> because I can't really, I can't picture anybody other than Alfred Molina playing Doc Ock, which is probably why this isn't the last time we're going to see Doc Ock. Is that right, KJ? <laughs> okay, well, we've seen the trailer now, so we know that that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But let's get down to some web-slinging pop quiz hot shot, shall we? <laughs> Sounds good. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go first, because I'm kind of curious to know if you wrote down any of these questions yourself. So I got about six here that I'm going to lay on you right now. Okay. What was the name of the play MJ performed in that Peter was late for? The Importance of Being Earnest. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Give me a hard one. <laughs> All right, fine. True or false? Doc Ock was originally supposed to be in the first film along with the Green Goblin. False. No, it was true. Oh, well, that is one thing I it was in. It was, <laughs> it was in. It was in. It was in one of the first original, I guess, screen story drafts. Like when they were trying to lay out the ideas, there was an idea of him trying to be, be included in it because, like, Sam Raimi wanted to have him in one of these films because he's such a fan favorite from the comics. But it's good that they saved him for this one. <laughs> also, I'm going to backtrack. I was going to let you ask another question first before I got back to this. Just letting you know. One of the reasons I absolutely 100% knew that the play was called Importance of Being Earnest is because that is one of the questions I wrote down for you, and I just realized that. Ah, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it would happen. It happens all the time <laughs> on this show. The next question is, what was Rosie trying to explain to Otto when they were both in school, studying in their own fields? She was trying to explain T.S. Eliot, and he was trying to explain the theory of relativity. Oh, fuck. How many times have you seen this movie? (laughs) A lot. All right. All right. Next one is when Peter dropped his books on campus, who was the second person to hit him over the head with their bag? Okay. I'm actually not familiar with this, um, but because you just clarified and said a person, I'm just going to say it's the director, Sam Raimi. (laughs) Your wild guess is correct. (laughs) That was him. Wow, and I okay. think, and I think they had to do a double take because Toby McGuire recognized him right away as he was walking by, and I think the uh, the arm strap like wrapped over his head and kind of yanked him a bit, and he thought that was funny. But what made him laugh even harder was the fact that it was Sam Raimi walking by. Well, so far that's the best fact you've given me because I didn't know. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I won up the Spider Man Two fanboy. <laughs> All right, next question. Finish this line. Did Bernoulli sleep before he blank? Wrote the curves of quickest descent. Ah, oh, Rosie, I love this boy. <laughs> God damn, making it too fucking easy. Holy shit. All right, it's going to be a pop talk first if you get this last question right. If it's all correct answers, this is a first. Okay. Because Tobey Maguire was suffering from back injuries prior to the filming of Spider-Man 2, which actor was hired to replace him? 
Well, Cody, I did not know this fact. So I have no, no. guess at all. Really? <laughs> You're kidding me. This is like one of the first things that I like researched on. I, I think I knew about this before, but I didn't know it was this individual that was supposed to replace him. You don't know this? Uh, I the only thing that I know or am aware of in any or am aware of in any way is the fact that I believe Jake Gyllenhaal was supposed to be Spider Man after Tobey Maguire, but that was for like the original movie, I thought. Oh, uh, you know what? I'm gonna give you half the point. I'm going to give you half the point. <laughs> Why is it Jake Gyllenhaal? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was supposed to be Jake Gyllenhaal to like, uh, I mean, it's good that this didn't happen. I mean, it, it wouldn't be the first time that they like s- shuffled actors in between a franchise. Like the Batman movies from the 90s did that where it went from like Keaton to Kilmer to Clooney. I'm kind of happy that it remained consistent, but I find it so ironic that it was Jake Gyllenhaal and then later on he becomes to be playing the Mysterio, oh, Mysterio in one of the other yeah. Spider-Man movies. <laughs> yeah, that's kind um, of ironic. Yeah, no, I'm pretty I, sure, I, I could be wrong on this, I'm pretty sure that Jake Gyllenhaal actually auditioned for the role of Peter Parker in the original Spider-Man and almost got it. Tobey Maguire got it instead. So I wasn't actually too shocked to understand that that was actually the person that they were looking at. Okay, sure, yeah, that might be the case of where Jake Gyllenhaal did audition and he was almost like the second fiddle, but because of the back injuries that Tobey Maguire was suffering from, like, Jake Gyllenhaal was, like, on the call, like, ready to replace him. Damn, yeah, because I had no idea that Tobey Maguire even had a back injury before this movie. <laughs> yeah, and in, in fact, the the irony is, the other irony behind all this is that, uh, that scene in the film where, like, Peter Parker's trying to, like, jump off the building to say that he's back as Spider-Man, but then he falls, and then he's, like, my back! Oh, my back! Oh, it was in the script where he funny. was oh all... Oh, my God. <laughs> he, 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 he was all... Honestly, he, uh, the whole story was that he was supposed to just fall and just get up and be like, oh, God, that hurt or something like that. But my back, my back is almost like an in-joke between Toby and Sam Raimi. Well... It's cool that I came up with Jake Gyllenhaal, but I did not know any of that story, so you just filled me in. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> All right, well, you know what? That's fucking close enough. You got, like, 95% of the way there of getting, like, a clean sweep. Holy shit. <laughs> well, I got a couple of trivia questions for you if you want. Lay them on me. What's the opening shot of the movie? Uh, the opening shot is, um, like, that's not including the... Uh, the title sequence, correct? No, not including the credits. So, like, what the what the credits kind of fade into? Oh, uh, it fades into um, I, I I guess like an advertisement for uh, I guess MJ's play, but it's MJ's face. Yeah. So all yeah, all I was looking for was that her face is on a billboard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. At the beginning of the movie, when MJ and Peter are talking in the backyard, and she asks him if there's something he wants to say, what's his response? Um, that's the, oh boy, yeah, scene, right? Yep, that's exactly the right scene. Okay, um, okay, it's funny because it, it's it's so poetic because it reminds me so much of the scene from the first movie when they're in the backyard. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, there's a couple scenes in this movie that are very reminiscent of the first movie. Um, yeah, I was trying to remember if the uh, I hunch line was from the first or second but i know that's not the answer i actually have no fucking idea <laughs> <laughs> that but you're right though that hunch line is actually from the first movie <laughs> okay okay yeah it's just it's uh, there's almost they're so they're so similar i'm just trying to yeah so like peter wants to say something clearly in the backyard and she's trying to get it out of him so she says is there something you want to say and his response is i was just wondering if you're still in the village okay during the bank heist when doc Ock flies out the window when he's fighting spider-man what does he hit once he crashes through the window? Uh, I think he crashes into a taxi and then he rips off the doors and throws it at him. 100% correct. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I was honestly just looking for you to say taxi. <laughs> I remember the action scenes more than the human scenes in the backyard. <laughs> All right, I'm going to jump back to the backyard for a second and back to my favorite scene in the movie in the backyard with Aunt May. So, when he first shows up, and there's a little boy helping Aunt May pack boxes in the backyard and stuff like that, do you remember the little boy's name? Ah, uh, okay, I'm wanting to say Henry Thomas. Oh, you're so close! 
Henry Johnson, Henry. Oh, you're Henry, even closer the second time. <laughs> uh, uh, jo- j- hey, Henry, it's Henry, Henry, it's Henry, Henry J. <laughs> Henry Jordan. I don't know. I I, I can't remember. <laughs> I'll give you ninety percent of that one. It's Henry Jackson. Henry Jackson. Okay. He des- he definitely deserved more than five dollars to help her move, but. <laughs> That's just me. Okay, I just came up with a trivia question that I want to ask you just because you asked me something about the scene earlier. Okay, so when they're talking sure. at the dinner table with Otto and his wife, what is the paper that Peter is writing about Otto? Uh, he was writing a report on fusion. That's it. I was looking for fusion. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to end with one last question for you. What's the scene after the credits? That's probably a trick question because there is no scene after the credits. I wish I could show you my notes right now because I wrote, this is a trick question. It was simpler times back then. There were no post credits. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's another thing. I like the fact that this movie isn't just being like, I have to sit through a whole whopping five minutes to see Oh, cool. They're going to tease something that may or may not happen in the next movie, which is what MCU <laughs> is prime of doing all the time. <laughs> I mean, they do it well. I'll give them that. They do it well. But I prefer the olden days where it's just you get the full story, the credits start, everything's done. Can you imagine if like it was like if Spider-Man 2 was made today where the film is actually like the film ends with spider-man like swinging off with all the helicopters and it fades to black and then you have to sit through the whole credits and then past the credits it's just mj sitting there looking like like i'm kind of worried and then that's it (laughs) (laughs) well no in in reality i think it it would tease one of the villains for spider-man 3 (laughs) oh oh yeah it would be like oh the symbion is now going through the atmosphere or something like that it's getting formed in space Actually, now that you're saying that, I think that might have helped Spider-Man 3 a little bit to see where it really came from. <laughs> oh, Spider-Man 3. Because it just falls out of nowhere. So it's kind of a funny, nice segue to get into breaking down the film because it's interesting that all three films have a very similar opening credit scene where the first film is just like that amazing Danny Elfman theme, by the way. It's really good. Really gets you excited. Danny Elfman's score is like the living heartbeat sometimes of these movies. Uh, apparently not for the third one because he wasn't part of the third one. It was some other person, which I looked up because <laughs> I knew something I, felt off about it. I, I was more just talking about one and two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He got credited for the original like themes, but it was some other person that did it. The opening, the opening of the first movie is just like names and then webbing and all that. What I love about the second one is that it's just such beautiful concept art to kind of illustrate all like the main characters to give the audience a bit of a refreshment on who they are and the major beats from the first film. And of course, they have to dumb it down horribly in the third movie and actually have like movie footage of the first two films. <laughs> I guess there's there's no nowhere you can go but <laughs> than than there to. Pull. <laughs> I just find it so funny the the just the <laughs> the, the escalation and like <laughs> descent at the last minute. <laughs> I don't know. I I don't think so negatively on the third opening credit scene. I think I think they just evolved the opening credits that the second one had. I mean, the movie has way worse things going on on the opening credit scene for me. <laughs> oh, sure, but it's just like not a good omen at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. I'm not a hater. I'm just I'm just more indifference about Spider-Man three. That's all. Oh, I'm I'm right with you. I, I feel very indifferent about that movie. <laughs> We're not the only people. <laughs> so we start off, like I said before, the first 15 minutes is just how the hell does Peter like balance out his life trying to be a superhero, but at the same time, his job is on the line as like a pizzeria delivery man. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Aziz, go! <laughs> <laughs> you know you know what is weird about that opening scene, though? What? Is the fact that, have you ever watched the actual extended cut of the movie that's about 20 minutes longer? Spider-Man 2.1? 
Yes, and I noticed I tried watching it the other day and I thought it was just going to be extended scenes. But then right away when I they changed the go, I was like, I immediately shut it off. And I was like, no, 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 I'm just going to rewatch the theatrical cut. I was like, I don't want them making unnecessary changes for the sake of doing that. The The way he said go is hilarious. Why cut it out? I, you know what's funny, though? That specific scene is one of the only scenes in Spider-Man 2.1 that are altered. Because most of the time, it is just extended versions of the scene. 90% of the time, it is. Um, there is one alternate. Was that the only time that you went back and watched that version? Uh, you might you might have played it for us back in the day, just to have on the background. I just can't remember. Any, I, maybe I remember the, the elevator scene, that awkward moment in the elevator where it's all quiet. I may remember it being a bit different. Yeah, the elevator scene's twice as long in that version. But no, it's pretty much so the scene with his the pizza parlor that pl- that scene plays out differently in the movie. I mean, and that scene plays out differently in the other version. But I think one of my favorite parts of Spider-Man 2.1 is, you know, the moment when he has his birthday celebration at the beginning? Yes. There's a part in the other version where that seems like at least 60 seconds longer. And Harry's elaborating more on his thoughts about the whole peter spider-man dynamic thing and he gets way more angry at him before he storms off and like go looks at that picture at the end of the scene okay so it kind of evolves harry a little bit more yeah i mean it it doesn't really add a lot to the movie or anything like that but it, it was nice to see that scene more fleshed out and then when you look back on the original cut you can see where they cut lines of dialogue of his out of the scene okay yeah, I, I can I can guess why they cut it out to begin with. Maybe they felt like it was already established a little bit too much at the end of the first one. And also you want to kind of warm everybody up equally at the beginning in the first 15 minutes. So it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, the first 15 minutes, just so entertaining to see him like try to like get to get these pizzas delivered on time. But at the same time, he has to like quickly dress down and become Spider-Man to save a couple of kids from getting run over. And then yeah. he doesn't make the <laughs> deadline. <laughs> like it leads to a lot of funny it leads to a lot of funny awkward moments like <laughs> when he's in the broom closet and it's just there's a lot of parts where it's like oh, it's so like quiet it's so funny and, and it just it just it just keeps going just like the the excessiveness of just how like flat and awkward it is of just when he's coming out of the broom closet and all the shit is still falling out and he's just trying to get it back in <laughs> it's like it just keeps going oh that's enough sorry i don't mean to keep going back to the other version but that, that scene goes on twice as long which i think might be a little bit tedious <laughs> <laughs> like i think i think once he starts to get that whole pile back into the closet i think another whole side of the closet starts falling out it goes on like so much <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly i would i if i was directing i'd leave that all in i don't even yeah care. i probably would have too because it's funny <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, he gets fired from Joe's Pizzeria. Apparently, the number on his helmet is a real pizzeria in New York. I don't know if they're still around, but at the time, they didn't care about getting promotion. It kind of helped them out a bit. If someone actually would call the number, a a pizzeria would pick up on the other line. Oh, that's a fun fact I didn't know as well. (laughs) That's awesome for them. (laughs) Oh, shit. Oh, my God. I'm on fire tonight. This is great. (laughs) I'm just, like, surprising you. Oh, surprising me. (laughs) A little bit, uh, maybe 10 minutes past where we're at now, when Peter's first introduced to Otto by his friend Harry. Early, uh, earlier in this conversation, you were talking to me about how there's an odd cut in the movie that you don't like. This particular scene when he meets Otto for the first time, there's a cut in this scene that bothers me. Uh, I know exactly which one you're talking about. It's in between them talking in the lab and then the dinner scene right after, right? Yeah, it seems very abrupt, almost like they're in mid-conversation and then mid-conversation again. I mean, I guess it didn't bother me as much because I looked at it as like they're just they're really hitting it off of or he's just getting a lot of information out for his paper and they've just been chatting for hours. But I think it's because right before it cuts to the next scene, it looks like Peter was about to say something. But yeah, I can tell where you're coming from of it being sort of awkward. I'm actually curious so that you don't forget to say it later on. I'm actually curious what your least favorite cut in the movie is. Oh, don't worry. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then Peter. Peter is just like she can't make it to school on time. I love that it's just he's holding for all three of the main people in his life: MJ, Harry, and Aunt May. There's something that he's holding back for 
each and every one of them just for different reasons. I can't tell MJ I'm Spider-Man. I can't tell Harry that I know more information about the death of your father. And I can't tell Aunt May that I'm perhaps partially responsible for the death of Uncle Ben. Not the complete responsibility, but there's something that he could have done to inter- inter- intervene and not make that happen. So there's just a lot of pressure on Peter right away in this film that was obviously like set up in the first one for obvious reasons. But I like how this this story, this movie, just it just runs with all those concepts. Oh, yeah. And the, the crazy thing is that it mostly pays all of them off by the end of the movie and nothing continues into three. Three is its own thing. So I 100% agree with you with the fact that all that stuff is set up in the first act of the movie and it all pays off in act two and three. For sure. But the most important thing that needs to get resolved is the rent. I can't stress this enough. (laughs) He has to pay the rent. He has to pay it off. So as he's getting to know Otto Octavius for his paper, they get on the subject about love. And he says, you know, you shouldn't just keep that all bottle up inside of you. You should read some poetry. So again, another little like nice little light moment of comedy. And I'm happy there's like the, the, the comedic moments that work throughout this movie happens where there's no score. And it's just sort of like just reality. Like realistically, if Spider-Man was trying to do his laundry, he only has enough time to do one load. So of course he's going to mix in his suit with his regular white clothes <laughs> and it just it changes the color <laughs> it's it's just it's 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 just those like realistic natural ideas where you're like yeah of course this would happen like <laughs> like what what would be some of the funny parts from the movie that you get a kick out of you going back to where you you were talking about him mentioning poetry to peter i i just love the cut to the laundromat when he's just all of a sudden thinking poetry is just gonna work and he's just reading from the poetry book as he's doing laundry (laughs) it's like he jumped on it like right away it's just like i need to fix this relationship so i'm just gonna do it now (laughs) exactly he's still in that sort of like fix of like i need to impress mj as best as humanly possible because at this point mj confessed her love for peter at the end of the first movie but he's like so wishy-washy and he He's holding things back and that kind of like confuses her. So it's totally justified why MJ gets irritated with Peter in this movie. By the third movie, I'm sorry, you might disagree with me. MJ becomes completely unlikable in the third movie. She just becomes like this jealous girlfriend of every single facet that Peter is going through in his life. It's like, give the guy a break. No, but in the second that. but in the second film it's a little bit more justified because all that P- Peter's just been so like busy doing stuff and not really being very like truthfully honest on how he how, how he feels about her. So when he says like I'm going to be there at your play, she she had like a genuine like surprise of like, "Oh, you're going to come? Just please don't disappoint me. I I I can't wait to see you there." N- full knowing that the audience knows that he's probably not going to make it the first time he tries. <laughs> exactly. So of course, like Peter didn't make it because he had to be spider-man and foil some bank robbers and mj is completely completely crushed by this they almost don't even talk throughout this whole after this whole segment yeah (laughs) and then uh when you know it's 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 established that you know that he's losing mj spider-man starts to kind of lose his powers he can't shoot any webs he can't climb up the walls as usual and peter's thinking what is this about is this a sign that i can't be spider-man anymore like what is this and then when Otto Octavius is giving a demonstration of his new experiment to kind of harness fusion, and right. he has to develop these arms to sort of harness this energy. So this is our, our sort of like ripple effects of our potential villain. He gets the arms infused to him. And right off the bat, the, the effects of these arms are still very well done. That's just one of the best things about all, I mean, three does add a lot more cgi than the first two movies did but that's one thing about these first two movies that are just still awesome to me because most of this stuff is done practical as much as they can even the arms 50 percent of the time and it just it just looks so much better on camera that's another thing that i love about all three of these movies as well as the two andrew garfield movies how the suit was practical yes tom holland's wearing something in the third in uh homecoming and far from home and the avengers franchise but on camera, or sorry, on film, it's it's all CGI, his suit. Yeah, that's a, that's a gripe I have. Actually, it's funny. In both 
Spider-Man 2 and then the amazing Spider-Man 2, the the suits are at their absolute best in those two films. Oh, well, especially comparing Amazing Spider-Man to Amazing Spider-Man 2, because I think the, the leap yeah, of absolutely. the suit there yeah. is insane. <laughs> yeah. So uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. If uh, they happen to come back in the future, uh, <laughs> I think they should be dressed up in those ones. <laughs> I have a feeling if they were to come back or when they do come back, quote unquote, um, <laughs> I think Toby, I think Tom McGuire is actually going to be in a Spider-Man 3 costume. And I think Andrew Garfield would be in his amazing Spider-Man 2 costume. Oh, sure. I mean, even even the suit from Spider-Man 2 and 3 are relatively similar. I just... Yeah. There's there's a lot I think cuz I think cuz the lighting in Spider-Man 2 is a lot better. Nothing just doesn't look phony and CGI as much as it is in the third film. Mm-hmm. Especially in the final battle of the third film. Oh my god, just a CG fest. <laughs> and that, and that's the thing, like I don't need a CG fest. That's what's so great about Spider-Man 2, especially with the arms is that it's just another old school trick of the fact that like if it's in camera or at least in close contact, sorry, if it's at least in close contact, do it practically. And then in just wide shots, of course do it CGI. Fucking Spielberg did that in Jurassic Park. Yeah, like later on, especially in the end, towards the end of Spider-Man 2, when like Doc Ock picks up Mary Jane and climbs the building with her. Like if you look closely, there's not two people climbing that building. That's CGI because you can't do that. <laughs> exactly. And obviously it would look a little bit better today because technology has come further. This is just what it looked like back then. And it looks far better than movie most movies today. <laughs> so I, You know, even though I said what I just said, I actually 100% agree with that as well. <laughs> Because like they just it's too reliant today on CGI like just it's a means of just like it's almost ironic that I'm saying this it's like they have all this great power why don't they have any responsibility? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Yeah, I, I personally believe that the best stuff still is always practical and the best CGI stuff that you can possibly do is environments and backgrounds and scenery and stuff that you add to the scene that's not noticeable. For example, like a movie like Mad Max Fury Road. You cannot tell that those backgrounds are CGI because it blends in. Or just uh, Blade Runner 2049. You know, like yeah. just uh, filmmakers that know how to utilize grand visuals. I'm sure we're going to see that eventually this fall in uh, Dune. We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, Cody's insanely excited for Dune. <laughs> insanely excited. All right, so carrying forward with the film, as Doc Ock is giving his demonstration on his experiment, of course, the inciting incident is that it starts to attract all everything magnetic in the room. And here, here's one co- funny thing. Spider-Man saves he- Harry in the scene. And it's funny how Spider-Man saves MJ and Aunt May later on in the film. So he saves all of his loved ones. But all of yeah. them have like a different reaction to it. Like Harry just says straight up, like this doesn't change anything between us. Like I'm still gonna hunt you down. Like Harry, all he has left now after the Doc Ock, like because the Doc Ock's experiment was supposed to like you know make Oscorp because he's now like the CEO of the company. It was supposed to make him like millions of dollars, but like it didn't go well. And then all Harry has left is nothing but Spider Man. So that's Harry's motivation throughout the whole movie is to hunt down Spider Man. But it's, it, it's, yeah. it comes from after a scene where Spider-Man rescues his, like, saves his life. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, again, that's just, to me, it's the fact that, look, you killed my father. It really doesn't matter if you're saving my life right now. I'm still going to hate you. <laughs> it's like, no time for redemption here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then, yes, as we said before, as we carry on, when all these doctors were trying to get an unconscious Otto Octavius in the hospital, all the arms off of his back using saws and and uh, yeah, because they have no tech to do it. <laughs> they have no tech, and they would know the first thing on how to take them off. Oh my god! All of just like the crazy angles and fast cutting and just raw screaming of all these doctors and nurses. It's <laughs> and, and just the sh- the hard sh- the hard shadows, just the the franticness of everything, even the point of view shots of the claws. Like it is. Just just a love letter to just Sam Raimi of saying like, yeah, absolutely. I, remember the Evil Dead? <laughs> like, I honestly, th- it might have been one of the most scariest parts in the movie growing up. It's taken out of a horror movie, and just not. There's just no gore. That's the only difference. <laughs> and then he wakes up, and he's just sort of like confused. He has no idea what to do, and he hides out in this like 
abandoned warehouse. And um, the first thing he does he says is just like, I, I have nothing else left other than just destroying these arms and taking my life with it. But uh, because of that little inhibitor chip that was implanted in the back of his neck, it got destroyed, which was it was made to sort of like have him under control of the arms instead of them controlling him. Alfred Molina's acting is so good in this scene where he's just like hearing a voice in his head and he's he's talking to like this sort of like artificial intelligence where the arms sort of influence him to rebuild the machine. He's just a mad scientist wanting to achieve his goal. It, he, he even said it like I didn't miscalculate like it was there was a chance where it was working and I felt it. So we're going to do this again. Yeah, because that was in his mind to begin with. Now that the arms are controlling him, that just makes them want to do what his original plan was, which is now even bigger and better than it was before. Exactly. So I definitely, I we'd be fools to not mention this individual re- reprising his role from the first one, uh, J.K. Simmons playing J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> just Arguably the best the cast loud, person the, in all three movies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> just the angry, the angry, bitter man that just has like a, a just a grudge on Spider Man, trying to make him like an infamous villain, even though he's not. Yeah. A lot of great cutting, a lot of great just interplay between him and uh, I forget the uh, Hoffman. Is that Hoffman? Is that his name? Hoffman. Yeah. <laughs> Sam Raimi's brother. Yeah, that's Sam Raimi's brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just a lot of great interplays. He's always just so quick and quippy, like trying to force Peter to take all these like photos. And I, I, I also didn't understand it as a kid. Now I do now. But like when he suggested, why don't we call Dr. Rock, uh, Dr. Strange? That's a good name, but it's taken. It's like, oh, years later, now I get it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did it take you until uh, did it take you until he was part of the MCU? Uh, yeah, essentially. Yeah. And I think the irony and it, it that's kind of funny how, uh, all of this might clash with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, well, yeah, that's going to happen in probably the, the MCU movies, I would assume. Uh-huh. And then we get to, like, one of the first big action scenes where Doc Ock is trying to rob the bank, and it was during the time where uh, Aunt May was trying to, like, get a new mortgage because her home is getting repossessed, but then she gets taken by Doc Ock, and Spider-Man is trying to, like, stop him. Really exciting and funny scene as well, which is, like, the bank teller, which I forgot was uh, Joel McHale. <laughs> 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 that boy of yours is a real hero. Wah, wah. <laughs> uh, it was. It, I think it was when I went to back to rewatch Spider Man Two after seeing the show Community. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I forgot that that was him. It was just like a small little extra. And speaking yeah. of small little extras, <laughs> I just I I we should almost keep like an an extra count in this film of just all like the funny people that just cheer off on Spider Man or just like like that one girl that's like, whoa, it's a web. Go, Spidey, go! <laughs> or when he's swinging with Aunt May, and then all of a sudden there's like this low shot of just those two girls watching him swing away. Oh yeah, when they're like, take me with you, Spider-Man! <laughs> <laughs> no, I think my favorite extra is when Doc Ock was climbing up the wall and all the claws are going through the building, that like <laughs> that one blonde woman that like runs up to the camera screaming. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so clearly Peter's hit kind of like a low point, obviously, with just like not being on good terms with Harry because Harry wants to know the true identity to Spider-Man and Peter doesn't want to give that up. MJ just being feeling like neglected by Peter that she just kind of drops the bomb on him saying that I'm with somebody. And then not even like a scene or two later, she she's getting married to him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that has a lot of repercussions on Spider-Man. He officially like... I, I'd say at this point, he's, his powers are officially, like, gone at this point. Yeah. And when he goes to see that doctor, really nice scene, too, where the doctor is trying to, like, Peter was trying to say to him that, like, I I have I keep having this dream, or my friend keeps having this dream that, like, he's Spider-Man, and he's climbing up the wall, but he keeps falling. What does that mean? And the doctor says, well, maybe you're just not meant to be Spider-Man anymore. Mm-hmm. And then in kind of, like, a premonition kind of dream where he's talking to the same kind of like car shot from the first mo- movie with him and Uncle Ben. He just comes to that conclusion now, like I cannot be Spider-Man anymore, which is like is the part in the trailer that when I said when I was a kid that made my jaw drop to the floor. What the the costume and the trash? Yeah, that's it. That's in a comic book, if I'm not mistaken, right? Oh, that shot was ripped right out of a comic book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's such a striking, nice visual. It's great composition. 
Okay, so <laughs> the raindrops keep falling on my head uh, scene. Because I think this scene's wonderful. I know you think it's over the top, but tell me why you think it's over the top. No, I don't think it's over the top at all. I wouldn't use that description for that. I I just think the song, in accordance with go- what's going on, is just, I don't know. I feel like it's a little bit corny. But that's all these movies, though. It feels almost, like, nicely acceptable. I don't know. I felt like that scene specifically went I and I don't want to say over the top I just think a lot further than the rest of the scenes that are like that in this movie went I I I'd like to use a food analogy I look at the um the raindrops keep falling on my head scene as almost like like if I compare the two I got two cups of juice one cup of juice has just like a little bit I'm adding a little bit of sugar to it just enough but then the other glass of juice has just tons and tons of sugar in it and that w- cup with the tons of sugar is the dancing Peter shit from the third film. <laughs> it's just too much of a good thing. Or not even a good thing, just too much of a, ooh, okay, no, I, I have a bad reaction to this. This is too much. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> it's funny how raindrops keep falling on my head is actually from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Yep, and I didn't even realize that until I had watched Butch Cassidy like years after seeing this movie. <laughs> Oh, and I bet that was distracting to you. <laughs> it was very distracting to me. <laughs> yeah, Peter's life is getting a little, little bit more ship-shaped and focused now that he's not Spider-Man anymore. He just shrugs off crime as it happens. <laughs> just... <laughs> now, okay, I actually want to ask you about this scene because I, I, I don't know how to feel about this scene. And I think you and I have talked about this before, maybe, but like after Peter finally like goes to see MJ at her play, she she's surprised she loves the fact that like he's there she kind of breaks character a bit during the performance yeah because i think it was more of i just think in that moment it was more of like i was expecting him to be completely done with me i can't believe this is even happening right now so it just made her smile i think in the moment <laughs> yeah i guess but the the part that i wanted to get was they have like this argument on the street afterwards where she's still sort of like feeling kind of like neglected and not like caring what he has to say and the fact that he's he's changed but i'm like didn't you kind of want change out of him anyways and then when she leaves in the taxi it's weird how he just like puts his glasses back on kind of weird and then like he just smiles and i'm like what well yeah because it's it's the one thing she said to him though it's it's like look you you waited way too long i'm with someone now i'm literally about to get married i don't know what to do about this right now but like she turns around and says you are different like maybe there's a chance this might work out i don't know Okay, and the reason why he smiled at the end was because he feels like there's a chance? Yeah, that's exactly what I got from that. Okay, I just, maybe I just need to kind of talk to somebody about this scene, because it just, thinking about it didn't really, like, make sense to me, but talking about it, I guess it makes sense now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, I'm so happy they cut out that scene, that, that deleted scene where, uh, J. Jonah Jameson tries out the Spider-Man suit. Oh, I disagree. That is so... That's too much. That That's a Spider-Man 3 scene. Yeah, no, I, I, I see that, but I don't know. I feel like I, when I watch that, it just makes me chuckle. I think it would have fit. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm 50-50 on that one. No, him him just being all giddy, the fact that he has possession of the suit, and the fact that, like, Spider-Man's finally quit. Yes. <laughs> like, that's good enough. No, because like that adds to it to me, like where he doesn't like the fact that Spider Man has the spotlight all the time. So like he felt the need to put it on to feel how he felt, almost in a way like like I don't want anybody to see. Like that's why he shut his blinds in there and stuff. To he like he shut his blinds, then put the suit on in his office and did all that stuff. Like he didn't want anyone to know he was doing that. So I don't know. I yeah. think that the scene works. <laughs> no, I don't know. I just. Ugh, I don't know. It just it rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> but here's a scene that now we finally get to the part in the film where there's a cut that rubs me the wrong way. And it's, okay. it's right at it's right after a really great moment where Peter finally confesses to Aunt May that like he basically lays out the whole story without giving away that he's Spider Man, but like just the, what happened that night when Uncle Ben got shot, where I went somewhere else to get some money. The guy ripped me off. Then the perp that was robbing that guy was running towards me and I let him, I stepped aside and let him go. And then later on, that guy ends up being the one who kills Uncle Ben. Right. Aunt May is completely like speechless and she gets up and leaves and it just holds. 
And then it just immediately hard cuts to this like a giant claw building a machine with like this loud like score happening. It, to me, it's so sudden and it's so jarring that I'm like, you needed just like a nice little like segue into the next scene, like an establishing shot of that warehouse that Doc Ock is in. Because it was just sort of like a sudden also reminder, like, oh, right, Doc Ock is in this movie. Because at that point, we hadn't seen him in a while. To right. me, it, it it always just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. How do you feel about that? Um, I never I never thought that about that cut, to be honest with you. I always just thought, it, if anything, a scene felt missing in between. But I don't know about a bad okay, cut. Okay, yeah. I, I, just, I just think... I think maybe there could have been one more scene added in between to ease into that <laughs> harder music. Yeah. Yeah. Something to kind of like not make it such a sudden thing. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of what r- rubs me the wrong way about it. So then when Doc Ock, like one last thing that he needs for his experiment is the infusion. So when he confronts Harry, Harry makes a deal with him. If you bring me Spider-Man to me alive, I'll give you all the training that you need. And the only way to find him is through my friend Peter Parker. I like how even though that Peter and Harry are not on good terms, he still yells to Doc Ock, don't hurt Peter. Well, yeah, because he doesn't know, though. <laughs> well, he doesn't know that he's he's Spider-Man, but it's also like he's my he's still my friend in the, in the same breath. Right. And then uh, that great scene where <laughs> Peter goes inside of a burning building to save this little girl. I like how the little girl <laughs> saves him because, again, there's a hero in all of us. Impossible, but yes. It's cute. Whatever. <laughs> I roll with it. What makes me laugh the most about that scene, though, is when he finally has her out of that room and they're hanging. And he, like, just throws her. <laughs> <laughs> like a rag doll, almost. <laughs> Literally just, like, smacks her up top. And she's like, I'm fine. I'm going to help you up. <laughs> <laughs> but some poor soul didn't make it out on the fourth floor. Oh, yeah. it kind of hits Peter really hard. Mm-hmm. How do how do you feel about uh, Ursula, Mister Dickovich's <laughs> daughter, that has a, a huge crush on Peter? Well, I think the word you just said about the little girl, where I think that that whole thing is literally just adorable. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 so subtly cute. As much as her dad, the landlord, just hates Peter, she, she still likes him. <laughs> yeah. And the third one, they kind of doubled down on it a little too much of her being, like, a prominent character. Oh, the whole... I just like well, how... I mean, it didn't help I, that they had him at that payphone, in the payphone scene there when he's just like, oh, bring me more cookies, oh, bring me milk. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just, again, too much. Too much of everything. <laughs> it's just... Can't say it enough about Spider-Man 3. <laughs> hey, I, I have a flaw about your favorite scene coming up here in the backyard scene. And uh-huh. I pointed it out to you. Do you know what it is? <laughs> yes, Not really but a flaw. it's only because you brought it up to me in the past. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a flaw. It's just, where was the continuity person on this day? Because when, M- when you know, uh, hey, you know Aunt May... Hey, it's not even continuity. <laughs> it's really not even continuity. Because... In okay, well, we might as well say what it is first. So when Peter goes to hug her, the first shot is him on her left or right. The other shot's the opposite. Exactly. Yeah. But now, what I think is that the continuity person didn't watch it, but also in editing, nobody decided to correct it because <laughs> that you can change like you can like keep the background and just kind of trace around them and flip them. It, it, it is easily correctable. I don't think it is easy correctable. I did think of flipping one shot, but then you'd have like the neighbor's yard on the other side of the no, frame. No, no, no. That's, just... that's what I just said. You can keep the background the way it is, trace around the people. Like it, you would do it in like After Effects and flip it. Like just flip the people in the scene. It's like they tried to cheat with that continuity of them just being like kind of an over the shoulder shot, but they should have just went with a traditional sort of hugging shot because it, it, it's jarringly awkward. <laughs> it's jarringly awkward only because you pointed it out to me, though, to be honest with you, because you're the only person in my life that's ever commented on that. Wow. Well, I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> And then when Aunt May gives that whole speech and Peter, I like the gra- I like the evolution or the, how gradual it is of, of Peter trying to be Spider-Man again. He, he doesn't just all of a sudden right off on a dime just become Spider-Man like he, he wants to become him again, but you just got to wait for the right moment. Yeah, even when he tries to like jump buildings, he fails. <laughs> he falls straight on his back in another funny, awkward scene of just him walking away with a broken back. The more and more I look at that scene, too, at the same time, though, I keep thinking, didn't he lose his powers, though? He must still have his super strength if he survives that fall. 
Very true. Oh my god, yeah, very true. Actually, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> oh like my god! You must god, not have lost yeah. everything. <laughs> and then uh, we get to we get to probably the first scene that we've ever seen from this film, or at least as far as I'm concerned, because this whole scene in the in the little coffee shop between Peter and MJ that was the teaser. Oh. I don't even, yeah, it's been so long. I don't remember the teaser for the movie. <laughs> the teaser was the majority of this scene, leading all the way up until when Doc Ock smashes the car through and then he just like appears. It just like hard cuts <laughs> there and then it shows like more, a little bit of a, more kind of a montage. But yeah, that, that's the first thing that, the first scene that the whole world was ever exposed to with this film. Yeah, when MJ says like, they're trying to come on better terms with each other in this scene. And when she says, I just want to see if there's any party that loves me, just kiss me. And okay, this might be a flaw, but like Doc Ock doesn't know that Peter is Spider-Man. So how is he supposed to know that Peter would have super ability strength? Yeah. Don't hurt Peter. I'm okay. All right. I won't hurt him, but I will throw a car through the fucking window of the coffee shop. And if it but I, 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 oops, sorry. I guess I killed him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even when he whips him at the end and buries him underneath all that rubble, it's like, like, was he going to go back to Harry and be like, okay, so killed Peter. Not sure what to do now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it turns out I kind of just killed two birds with one stone. Uh, <laughs> Spider-Man's dead. <laughs> Uh, and your friend happens to be dead. I'm sorry, but uh, can I have some trinium, please? <laughs> 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 yeah, then Doc Ock kidnaps MJ. Spider-Man goes after him. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, this might be the biggest laugh in the whole movie in the theater when I saw it initially. Of just when <laughs> J. Jonah Jameson is like finally warming up and kind of having a, a turnaround of like, you know what? I think I was a little too hard on Spider-Man. He was a hero. He was a... And then in mid-sentence, when, like, Peter steals the suit, he was a thief! <laughs> he was a criminal! <laughs> yeah, I love that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest laugh in the theater for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then we get to probably the most impressive action sequence in the whole film. Oh, the is train the train scene. sequence. <laughs> oh, excellent. So well-paced. So well-shot. It, it's, like, one of the best action scenes in any superhero movie, I think, ever. <laughs> Yeah, just the, everything. the pacing, the everything. Yeah. This is like a quality action scene. Mm -hmm. And then after when Doc Ock finally captures Spider-Man and brings him to Harry, gets his trinium, now it's Harry's face-to-face -face with the person who he believes killed his father. Takes off his mask. Just like he's so devastated the fact that it's his best friend. Yeah, I just, I think the best moment in that scene is how the scene ends too, where he just goes... I know we have a lot to get through, but the bigger things that are happening here are way more important. Yeah, the bigger thing meaning like MJ's kidnapped and uh, the fact that like this whole city is about to get like half the sucked city's in. just gonna explode. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was a nice foreshadow that Doc Ock said originally, where he's like, "Oh, Rosie, our good friend Peter here thinks I'm gonna blow up the city." Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then when uh, Peter confronts Doc Ock and trying to rescue Mary Jane, he tries to really get to to Otto, really. Like, he knows he's just sort of, like, manipulated and kind of, like, influenced in a wrong way. But, like, he's just saying you got to destroy this infusion. It's just too powerful. And you shouldn't believe in these claws. And just like he said before, like, it's nice to see, like, that speech come back to sort of, like, change Doc Ock's mind. His whole dream was essentially just to make this infusion, but like he knows that it's it's the right thing to do is just to not to get to give this up because, like he said, he's not a criminal. He's like at first he's like whoa 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 I'm not going to steal money to rebuild this machine. Like he's not just bad right off the dime. No, he's not. But like he's been easily manipulated because they're connected to him. That's that's the hardest part to watch. Yeah, that's it's, he, and he's not like a one dimensional villain like a uh, fucking Eddie Brock or some yeah. shit like that. Where it's just he's like, oh my god, so it doesn't even feel like a real person. Well, no, Brock Eddie wasn't even supposed to be in Spider Man Three. The studio forced him in, so it wouldn't be the first time studio interference to <laughs> like nope. comic book movies. No, but that was the early days but, of that. <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah, very true. It kind of yeah, yeah. It's it's side note. It's kind of funny that the Spider Man trilogy, the original, the Sam Raimi, and the original X Men trilogy almost went down the exact same path. Just too much happening in the third installment. <laughs> yeah, the first movie nicely sets everything up. Honestly, if it, it if it wasn't for the those two franchises, I don't think we would have the MCU today. 
Oh, I completely agree. X-Men started it, Spider-Man continued it, and then, yeah, there were stumbles in between all of that stuff, like <laughs> movies like yeah. Catwoman. But... Oh, yeah, of course, there's, like, exceptions. Yeah, like, there's this, a... Even the same structure, like, X2 and, X- and Spider-Man 2, the best of those three those those two trilogies and then 100%. the third film is just the third film is just like too much of everything that it just falls apart and again although what i will say is there's a lot of good stuff in spider-man 3 there's not there's not that much good stuff in the third x-men <laughs> you know what yeah that is true yeah if i had to compare what's better i think spider-man yeah, yeah you know what spider-man you can 3 is tell least... that there was interference with the third spider-man the third x-men just feels like a mess in general yeah, I'd rather watch a Sam Raimi film than a Brett Ratner film anyway. Oh. <laughs> so you are you are right when you say that. <laughs> I wasn't but going there with that, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> but as we carry forward, like Doc Ock sacrifices himself to destroy the fusion. And yeah. MJ finally finally doesn't have to sit on a hunch for the rest of her life on thinking, is Peter Spider Man? Because now she officially knows. <laughs> it's I don't know. I go back and forth with that moment. I think it's great. But you know what I think there's a lot of in the finale of this movie? A lot of questions and close ups on everybody's faces reacting to things. Uh, you know, it's again, it's going back to just like Sam Raimi trying to be like a bigger picture kind of guy with emotion because it's very Spielbergian almost. Like Spielberg is is perfected and invented the push in for emotion on a yeah, person's face. You, you know, you know what? I I see the I see the resemblance to Spielberg in this scene. Now that you said that, <laughs> I never I never made that connection. That's the power of cinema. <laughs> <laughs> When you're influenced by the right people, it just helps you out even more. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Then now that MJ finally has like the bigger picture that like Peter is Spider Man, she's still kind of what you think at first. She goes on with her life and just is going to get married. But first, we get to a scene where Harry is kind of getting influenced by his father, William oh, Defoe, man, making this a is really the quick most disappointing yeah. part of the movie because of three. <laughs> <laughs> What a waste of potential this was! <laughs> like That's just... exactly what I was gonna say. It would have been, it would have made for such a freaking awesome third movie. I know this would have never happened, but could you imagine? Like the end of this just continues into three, and just the main villain of the third movie is just friend versus friend. Yeah, yeah, that would have been great. And then, like after that, then go into Spider Man Four and create a new villain and all that. <laughs> well, that's what the original plans were, but. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a shame. And then, like, MJ doesn't show up at the altar at, his, at, her, at her own wedding. She runs very comically and happily <laughs> as much towards... As I, uh, it's weird, because I root for all of that stuff at the end of this movie, but at the same time, I feel bad for the other guy. <laughs> oh, no, I don't feel bad for him at all. In fact, like, it almost could have been a setup for him to become a villain in the next movie. Oh, okay, well, that would have been a little bit over the top. <laughs> And then MJ says, you know, I, it's just one of the most character defining moments, really. Well, it's actually, here's, here's one really big point I want to make before we wrap it up the breakdown is that finally, when Peter confesses all these secrets to all the, his loved ones, like MJ, I'm Spider-Man, Harry, I'm also Spider-Man and Aunt May, here's the real story on what happened that night with Uncle Ben's death. All three characters handle it very differently. As you said before in your favorite scene, like the outlook that uh, Aunt May had kind of for, she has a, be- a better outlook is what I'm trying to say of pushing forward. Like it was devastating news, but she sort of learns how to like just still forgive Peter. And mm-hmm. and with Harry, the actions of Spider-Man created a new villain. Like you, you don't even need to see the third film. It just teases that potential of the fact that like Spider-Man creates his own villains sometimes. And then finally with MJ, like she says, I want to be part of your life. I know the consequences that are going to happen in the future, but like I still want to be there for you because I love you. And then when they kiss, they hear some crime going on. She says the the signature uh, line, "Go get him, Tiger." Go get him, Tiger. Yep. And then just as another reminder, you you think, oh, we're seeing Spider Man swinging. Oh, such a great superhero movie and all that. Just another reminder of just giving more depth to this film. We get one last shot of MJ just looking there, just feeling very worried and almost like contemplating, was this a good idea? Yeah, no, it was great. <laughs> just just, the, just <laughs> the fucking complexity of this movie. It's just, yeah. it's amazing. It is. 
Well, that was Spider-Man 2. So, KJ, just any final thoughts that you have on this film? <laughs> uh, man, I could just run through it, the whole thing over again. I just I love everything about this movie so much, and I just had a blast talking to you about it. Yeah, no, it it's certainly a, a, a comic book movie that, like, I'm not really big into the comic book and superhero genre altogether, but this is one that I always seem to come back to because I just I'm I'm so happy that like it was something I was so excited for back then and it paid off. And the fact that it's really character driven, it's very it's it's definitely the most focused out of the three Sam Raimi films. And the filmmaking is very impressive and it has everything almost in the right place. I'd almost feel like it's almost like a miracle that it turned out as great as it was they probably underestimated the fact that they had such a great film under their belt while they were making it they probably didn't know that it was going to turn out as great as they thought initially same with the video game too spider-man 2 for playstation 2 i played the shit out of that game back then <laughs> spider-man 2 is the best video game they ever made well um, not say that I'm taking that back <laughs> yeah well, i was about to say yeah the two new ones you love back in the day spider-man 2 was a game i played all the time that game was fantastic but nothing holds a candle against the the spider-man game that was just called spider-man that they put out for ps4 to me more than any of the spider-man movies that game tops it yeah i still have to play it actually because i know that the playstation 2 one is almost like a precursor to how great the newer one is today where it's almost very similar where you can just swing around new york and just do little odd jobs like you don't have to do the story mode right away you can just like roam around and deliver pizzas <laughs> like, it's like grand theft auto if you were a superhero <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah that's a great, great comparison actually <laughs> and you know the andrew garfield movies i don't hate them as much as everybody else does they definitely they have better chemistry i'll say that like between andrew garfield and emma stone i like their chemistry a little bit more than uh than toby mcguire and, and christian dunce it's almost like Mark Webb made like this indie romance movie, but it just happens to be a Spider-Man movie. <laughs> yeah. It's a shame that there was only two films and it almost feels like we watched like an unnecessary remake of the first Sam Raimi movie with amazing Spider-Man. Yeah. And then, but it's like, imagine watching that movie. Imagine watching the first Sam Raimi movie and then jumping right to three. That's pretty much what the second amazing Spider-Man felt. I agree with you. <laughs> exactly. It's like, did you not learn from your mistakes? <laughs> too many villains, too many subplots, like, holy fuck, like, yeah, there's a few good moments and all that, good acting, it's just, like, it's just disposable junk, and then, oh, God bless Tom Holland. <laughs> the second he pops up in Civil War, I'm like, oh my god, they got the right guy. He's he's Spider-Man, like, he he's he just has, like, this great enthusiasm about him, he's, he, he's a he's kid. He's the embodiment of what it was in the comics and cartoons. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I, I like where they're going with this character. Like, Spider-Man Homecoming was like a nice teen movie, almost. Yeah. Like a love letter to John Hughes movies. And then, even though I've only seen Far From Home once, Far, I, Far I don't remember Home's much actually, from it. Uh, I don't know what it is about that movie. Uh, that I still put Spider-Man 2 easily as the best live-action Spider-Man movie ever made. I don't think that's ever going to be topped, even with the upcoming No Way Home. <laughs> but I will say Far From Home is probably my second yeah oh okay yeah i might i don't know i need to like really break these down but i might even like it more than the first raimi hmm. i may have to like think about it would you actually add in uh spider-man into the spider-verse as well um i i was trying to leave it out that's why i was saying live action <laughs> it's funny i i i loved the movie the first time we saw it i hadn't seen it since and I have a strong feeling if I watch it again, there's going to be something that clicks with me where I'm just going to think it's fantastic and one of my favorites, actually. See, I've had the <laughs> like... opposite response. I thought it was the best one ever made when we watched it in theaters. And then I've probably watched it two or three times since. And I no, I still prefer Spider-Man 2 over it. Okay. Yeah, no, I so far, I, I definitely prefer Spider-Man 2 over all the movies. Spider-Man has just been like a... Same with Batman, just a, a, a superhero that I've being able to get behind throughout my whole life like i i watched a, a good well not a good handful but like a few really really good episodes of the 90s animated show before i actually saw the raimi film so i was a little bit of experience with spider-man before he was brought onto the big screen mm -hmm. and yeah man you bet your ass you and i are going to be there for no way home this december because absolutely because i'm telling you right now 
and I'm going to hate this if we go back to this podcast months later. If it doesn't happen, I'm going to be so disappointed. And you know what I'm talking about, that moment. We need that moment where we got all three of these web slingers on the screen together. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm prepared for both. I'm prepared for it to not happen or for it to happen. If it does, try not to squeeze my leg too hard when you're sitting next to me. <laughs> Try not to yell in my ear with excitement I think too I loud. Think I, I think I'll just be <laughs> silent, staring at the screen, crying. <laughs> Could you just cry? That's all you need to do. <laughs> I think I'm just gonna have a giant smile on my face. That's all. No, like that's I, all I'm just gonna, gonna be like, to yes. <laughs> no, it, it it hopefully this is the most juicier and and most ultimate Spider-Man movie that's out there, but. I think I've come to the conclusion that nothing is ever going to top the iconicness of Spider-Man 2. No, just as a standalone movie on its own. Like, you can't, you got to go through the history of all these movies to get to the point that we're at with No Way Home. I don't think No Way Home will ever be looked at the same way people look at Spider-Man 2. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, it's definitely going to, it clicks with everybody in certain generations. That's the thing about Spider-Man. As as long as you capture the essence of the character, then it's going to resonate. Right. And in this case, you and I have been it through the very beginning, I would say, since 2002. If only No Way Home was coming out in 2022, we would have looked back going, holy <laughs> shit, KJ, we've been watching these for 20 years. We have. We would have probably seen No Way Home last year, though, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. For obvious reasons. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah no, it's it, again, same with Batman. I like that character. I'll probably be in the theater for any sort of incarnation throughout the rest of my life, probably. Spider-Man or Batman? Sign me up. I'm really looking forward to Matt Reeves with Robert Pattinson. Oh, yes. <laughs> Anytime you play a Nirvana song in the trailer for your movie. <laughs> Cody is sold. <laughs> <laughs> well, KJ, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. This was almost like a perfect film for us to sort of like show our dynamic about film yeah i've never podcasted before so to be honest with you if it wasn't for anything in this vein i probably would have not done this for you <laughs> not just a film but just like you have a very um an admiration for superheroes so i thought this would have been perfect for both of us yeah when they're well told i do <laughs> absolutely and of course kj i would love to have you back on this show sometime in the future to talk about something or a film that we either equally love or equally hate. <laughs> hey, equally hate might be even more fun. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much for having me on. Of course, man. And everybody listening, thank you so much for listening to the first season of Pop Talk. I want to thank Evan and Lyle again for giving me the opportunity to make my own show on their channel. I want to thank all my friends that have joined me on the show. I love you all. It was just a giant pleasure to have you guys all on the show. It was so much fun. I would love to come back for another season in the future. I might take just a little bit of a break just to get some things figured out. But definitely check out more content on So To Speak as well as Pop Talk. And I will see you on the next one, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for listening. Cheers.